continue in our time of worship that way. Um, so as you can see, there's a plate here in front of me. There's also a couple plates uh, at, by each door, surrounded by some buddy barrel boxes um, for our BGMC offering that we're going to take up at the end of this month. And so I'm going to pray over that and also here over this box as well. Um, this box uh, represents the names of our loved ones, co-workers, friends uh, who do not know Christ. And it's our heart, our desire, individually and together as a church, to, that people would know Jesus, that people would get saved and come to the knowledge of him. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you just for everything that you do and just who you are. God, I pray now for the names in this box and the souls that they represent, Lord, that you would speak to them, that you would draw them closer to you. God, that you would show them your love that you have for them. And Lord, that you would not abandon them or leave them alone. But Lord, that you would reach out to them and comfort them every single day. God, I pray for us as your church. You'd fill us with boldness and give us opportunity to preach your word and to be a witness to you in this world. Lord, bless this time that we have together. Bless this offering that we are going to take, Lord God. I pray that you use it to do whatever you see fit to further your kingdom. We thank you and we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and drop your offering off in whatever plate is most convenient for you. Um, and if you haven't grabbed one already, go ahead and grab one of those buddy boxes if you don't mind. And we're going to take up a special offering at the end of the month for BGMC, which is how our kids give to missionaries. So uh, let's go ahead and move on with announcements. We have a couple exciting ones today. So first of all, uh, today we are getting ready to update our directory for 2021. And today, if you would like a new picture for the directory, uh, today's the last day. So if you would like a new picture, the one in there is a little outdated. Uh, today is the last day to do that. You can't procrastinate on this one anymore. I'm sorry. I love to procrastinate too, but you can't. You just can't. So if you would like to get a new picture, today you can talk to Miss Joy Hester or Miss Sydney Fetters, and they are going to help you take a picture. They'll meet you right up here at the front of the stage after service. Um, if that is something that you would like to do. So this announcement, this next one, is actually from last week. If you guys remember last week, we had our Fall Fest uh, last week. And from what I understand, it was amazing. It was a great, great time. Uh, even though we had downsized some things this year and made it not quite as open just to keep everyone safe and sound in the community as best we can, there were still around 40 kids that came. Um, and their parents that came and were downstairs and, and having fun, playing games, eating some candy. So the kids might have liked it better, as Pastor Steve said this morning, because they probably got more candy. So uh, it was a good time. And then just yesterday, we had a candy giveaway uh, for Halloween for trick-or-treating, where some people drove through and we passed out bags of candy. And also a little uh, thing that had the gospel message and some information about our church in them as well. Um, so we handed, over, over, handed out over 100 bags of candy into the community, um, which means 100 messages of the gospel got put into people's hands um, from yesterday. So I just want to say thank you uh, to everyone who helped either at the Fall Fest or by donating candy. You helped us impact our community for Jesus um, in ways that we will probably never fully understand. Um, but thank you for helping us to impact that community. Um, and then our last announcement that I want to do today is about our Thanks and Giving Week. Thanks and Giving Week. So Pastor Steve mentioned this one yesterday, uh, last week, I mean, uh, talking about our Thanksgiving service and how unfortunately we're not going to be able to do it the same way that we had in the past with all the food and all of us crammed really close together in the tables eating. However, we are going to take this obstacle and make an opportunity out of it to impact our community to partner with some other ministries in Canton Alliance uh, and in this general area and help them express our thanks to some people here in Louisville and then also give and help these other ministries to spread the gospel because they need some help as well. And so we're going to take that opportunity to spread the love of Jesus out of these doors, out of these walls instead. And so you see there's a whole bulletin board back there with the thanks and giving stuff. We are doing a lot of things. We are donating drinks and snacks to um, police and fire for Louisville and the Michelin Township. Uh, so if you'd like to do that, there's a sign-up sheet back there. We're making hot meals for some battered women's shelters and some other ministries as well. Um, and again, there's sign-ups for those meals, days to cook it, things that we need. So there's still kind of that aspect there. Um, and then... What we're doing, I'm going to highlight some of our ministries throughout the weeks as we lead up to this. And so today I want to highlight one of the ministries that we're helping. 
It's called Hannah's House. Hannah's House is one of the ministries that we are doing here. And so I looked up some information about Hannah's House, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about it and what we are going to do as a church to help them. So Hannah's House is a ministry that helps at-risk and trafficked girls, um, girls who usually are under the age of 18 who are at risk of being either human, like sex trafficked, labor trafficked, um, to get hard into drugs or homelessness, and to try to help them come out of those situations and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just physical, but it's also spiritual needs. And the way that they do this is they have a couple of drop-in centers to help them with just like basic necessities and things, but they also try to pair girls up with a mentor to help mentor them through, help them find you know, jobs, help them get out of those situations. And so what we are going to do is we are going to make care packages as a church to give to some of these uh, girls, some of these women who have been trafficked or who are at risk for being trafficked or homeless. Um, and so what I want you to do is I want you to take a moment and I want you to imagine that you're in this situation, that you have either been trafficked or are being trafficked, right? So here's what happens when you're trafficked. You're taken away from your friends and family. You have no one. You rely on your trafficker for a place to live, money, food, a job, possibly if you have kids, a place for your kids to live. You rely on them for everything. So if you're trying to come out of it, you have nothing. You have nothing. Imagine that you're in that situation. You're trying to get out of this, this bad, evil, terrible lifestyle. And you want out, and, but you know if you have nothing. And so you go to one of these drop-in centers and imagine how meaningful some of these items would be when you have nothing. A pillow, right? You have nowhere to lay your head, but they give you a pillow. Again, this isn't for me to sleep, I promise. But we have some other things here. I'm just going to look through them. Lotion, deodorant, a toothbrush, uh, some shampoo and conditioner, a sponge. Imagine how meaningful that would be. You know, you're trying to get a job. Try going to a job interview when you haven't showered or brushed your teeth in a week. See how that turns out for you. It's important. These are important things, and we're doing important things for these girls, for these women, not because it's just a good thing to do, but because it's what Jesus Christ would do. And we're trying to show the love and be the hands and feet of Jesus through partnering with Hannah's house because they have that availability. They already have people coming to them. Instead of us trying to do it directly, we're partnering with them to do it. So these are kind of the care packages. Oh, also, just a Walmart gift card, a $10 Walmart gift card, just to help with any other basic necessities that they may need that we're not thinking of. These are the things that we're going to give, and we're going to make these, build them all together one week um, on our build day that's uh, on the calendar, and put them together and give them so that these girls can have something and hopefully help them come out of that way that they were living, that they were forced into living, and into a relationship with Jesus Christ is the end goal. So that's what we're doing, and that's what I would like us to do. So if you are interested in helping Hannah's house, you'll see a flyer on the bulletin board with more information there. And there's also little purple tickets, little purple tickets that you can take. And if you take one, that means that it's kind of like, think the giving tree. You take a ticket, you're responsible to bring that. You can take multiple tickets. You can take five, six, however many you want. You can take a whole package if you want to donate one of those. But that means that you're responsible for bringing them here. We'll build them together on that day. And then someone will go and deliver them to Hannah's house as well during that week leading up to Thanksgiving. All right? I feel like now is a good time to pray again just for Hannah's house and for this ministry. All right. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, God, help us. Help us, O oh Lord, to be your hands and feet. God, help these girls, these women who are being abused and trafficked. Lord God, help bring them out of it. And Lord, help use our church, help use Hannah's house as a tool, Lord God, in your hands to help spread your gospel and make your name more known. Lord God, we thank you for our heart. We thank you for your heart, Lord, for the, the lost and the broken. Lord God, we love you. Help us, oh Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. That's all I have for today. Would you help me in joining Pastor Steve as he comes and brings our word this morning? Thank you, Pastor Jake, for sharing all that. I'm excited about what Jesus is going to do through us and even to us as we show gratitude, as we share generously in this month of November. Uh, if you didn't get the memo, hey, it's November. Happy 
November 1st. How many of you are excited? We made it through another month, everyone. 2020, we've only got two of these left to go. Two months left to go this year. Uh, just curious, uh, how many of you uh, enjoyed that extra hour you got last night by sleeping extra? How many of you got extra sleep? Okay, good. There's some bright eyes in here. Uh, how many of you, uh, you used that extra hour to, to do more? You got up early or you, you stayed up late, like you burned the midnight oil or you got up before the roosters this morning, you used that extra hour and you did some work. All right. And how many of you have small kids and that time change just doesn't matter? <laughs> you, you went to bed late and you got up early. We are praying for you. You can put on an extra, you can have an extra cup of coffee uh, in our name today. <laughs> we said, hey, may you be blessed uh, today. Well, it is. It's the, the time change Sunday. Uh, it's the first Sunday of November. Uh, and so those two things together, I thought I'd give you a little uh, peek into my life and what you can expect from uh, your pastor. I've been doing this for a couple years now. Uh, my relationship with facial hair goes with the seasons. So just so you know, Mrs. Patient uh, likes this, the clean shaven look the best. Uh, but as I get older and as I have less up here, I desire to have like something to keep my head warm. And so... <laughs> A couple years ago, I did my first no-shave November, uh, and I just carried that on. It was, it was my way of starting a beard, uh, doing no-shave November. And then a couple years ago, I told my wife, I think I'm going to do a time change beard. I'll stop shaving when we turn the clocks back in November, and I won't start shaving again until we change the clocks in March. Uh, so that's our compromise for right now, that, that I get a beard during the cold weather months, and she gets the clean shaven during the warm weather months. So just so you're prepared, right, uh, it gets worse before it gets better. Like the scruff is coming, okay? Uh, that, that's what it's going to look like. And so you're welcome to join me, uh, men, in uh, No Shave November. You can do it. Uh, teenagers, I know some of you guys, you've not shaven ever. And so you can keep that going. Uh, you're, you're right. You are welcome to join as uh, we're happy to flip to a new month on the calendar. Uh, we're happy to turn towards some thoughts of uh, thanksgiving and generosity. I uh, are excited to do that, and I'm going to keep my face warm as we get in the cold weather months. Well, today is our third and final piece of our series, Who's the Boss? Where we're not talking about uh, an 80s sitcom, but we're talking about the king of the universe, the Lord. He is the boss, the man in charge of all of us. And so what we're doing is looking at leadership in the Old Testament as we're following the story of God's people uh, we see some of these different phases of leadership for them. Uh, and even though the leader changed, the boss never changed. God was always the boss. But as he led his people, he had some different ways of doing that. And so I've titled this morning's message, Never Forget. And you know, to cut to the chase here, let's never forget who the boss really is. And we're going to look at that today by looking at the life of the first king of Israel, King Saul. And what we're going to learn from the life of King Saul is that even though man looks at outward appearance, God judges by the heart. So as I was thinking about this this week, I thought about how uh, we pick people, how we get picked. How many of you remember uh, on the playground and it was time to pick teams for kickball and uh, the anxiety maybe that was in your heart, you didn't want to be picked last. Is anybody honest enough to say you remember that? Right. Some of you didn't have to worry about that. You were picked first and... Uh, and we're still jealous about that, if that was you, if you got picked first. But some of us waited to get picked. Uh, there's a lot of situations in life where we hope to get picked. Uh, you probably, you're probably sitting next to a person who picked you. You might be sitting next to a spouse and how good that felt to be picked. I was thinking about one moment in my life where I tried to get picked, and that was when I went out for the eighth grade basketball team <coughs> at Aylin Junior High School in Puyallup, Washington. Um, was I a basketball player? No, I was not. Uh, had I ever been on a basketball team? YMCA, Little Tykes? No, I had not. Uh, but I, a, a, as an enthusiastic young man, had played a lot of driveway basketball with my dad, uh, if that counts for anything. Uh, he taught me my jump shot, uh, my free throw shot. He taught me how to rebound. He taught me how to lose gracefully uh, as he beat me. Uh, on the basketball court. He didn't beat me in life. He just beat me in the, on the basketball court. But I remember as an eighth grader, like, I want to play basketball. And so I did what I thought it might take to get ready. Uh, I came to my church's, like, Monday night uh, youth and young men's basketball nights. And so I remember thinking as I think I was a 13-year-old at the time, I'm playing against uh, 18, 19, 20-year-old guys in a gym just like this. 
uh, on a Monday night, somebody unlocks the gym and you just play around and around until you're done. And I did that three whole weeks in a row. That was my training camp for eighth grade basketball. And so I, I came to that tryout thinking that I'd done a lot to prepare, that though I might not have looked like much on the outside, I was a thick young man, uh, that I had something on the inside that the coach didn't know about. Well, apparently it was so deep down on the inside that, that the coach never found it. Because <laughs> I did not make that eighth grade basketball team, though I tried. Though I tried something that I, I would never advise. I, I thought during the sprints I would show the coach that I was really running my hardest. And so as I came across the finish line, I would just about fall over <laughs> trying to make it. Did you know that you don't run that fast when you're like flopping and falling over? Right? Like, they don't teach you that in track, right? You keep your stride through the finish. I didn't know that because I was also, spoiler alert, not a track athlete either. I was never fast, but I just thought I would try hard. That The coach would see that Steve Patience, somebody who's going to try hard. And I don't know if he ever got that message, but he said, son, it might be good if you try hard at something else. Like, <laughs> I hear the wrestling team doesn't cut people. Maybe you should join that. But there's a lot of things that, that we either get picked for or, or pick other people for in life. What does it take? To get picked. On the basketball team, it takes a little bit of talent. It takes a jump shot. It might take some physical ability, some strength, some speed, uh, some endurance. What's a, what's a coach looking for? A coach is looking for somebody who knows what they're doing. Or what should you be doing? You should be working on your craft. But what does it take in life to be picked? What, what are people in authority looking for? What's the person in ultimate authority looking for? in picking leaders, in picking people who will lead the charge for God's kingdom, in picking people who will be up at the front. And what should we be doing about it? What should we be doing if the Lord is the one doing the picking? See, we just finished last week, we were talking a little bit about the judges of Israel, a, a three-century period where God would pick leaders one at a time. It was not handed down. It was not election. It was really the Lord's divine choice which judge would be picked for the moment. And you don't have to turn there, but in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, the whole situation is summed up in these words. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Now that worked in different ways. There was times it was better and there was times it was worse. And people eventually got to the point where they felt it was much worse. And so eventually they asked God for a king. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, it talks about how this process folded out. In verse 5, the people said, Appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. In verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel, don't, don't consider this. Samuel was the final judge of Israel. He said, don't consider this an indictment on you. But the Lord said to Samuel, it's not you that they have rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. They might not have realized they were doing that at the moment. They said, God, give us a king. They said, we don't like this level of leadership you've given us. We want someone because we see it all around us. And then in verse 19 of 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says, The people said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. And spoiler alert, they became just like all the other nations. It wasn't a good situation. They said, we want a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. Oh, that might have been the issue of the heart that God was after they wanted someone to lead them in battle and fight their battles for them when God said, I've been here the whole time. But, as it says, the people rejected God as king and asked for one of their own. So, the Lord kind of gives them, like he does with us sometimes, he says, uh, have it your way. And he shows them what it looks like to have a king. So what we're going to look at this morning is how God chooses his leaders based on what's in their heart. God chooses his leaders based on things that cannot be seen. God chooses... Uh, his directors based on the direction of their life. So for us, how can we take care of our heart in order to be the people in leadership that God needs us to be? See, we all have levels of leadership in our life. You may have a title at work that gives you a level of leadership with other people. You may have a role in the community in an organization uh, that requires leading. You may have a role in our church uh, that, that whether you are the point person or one of the people you're leading, you're influencing others. And you may have a role in your home, whether or not your mom or dad, but just 
in your family at large. You may have a role of influence with other people. I believe God would speak to us through his word about how to use that. And this week of all weeks, we're going to elect some people. We're going to elect some people because of what they've done. And we might elect other people based on what they say they're going to do. If only we could take an x-ray and see into the heart of every single leader who's trying to get a job from us and see what's going on in their heart. See where they're at today. Even if we could, we wouldn't know where that heart's going to be at in the future, where that person's going to be at going forward. But those are the kind of leaders that God was looking for. So God has chosen you and me for our roles of influence based on what he sees in our heart. And where our leadership goes and what God does with us is contingent on the condition of our heart going forward. But like Samson, the last place that you want to be is going into a battle without realizing that, as the scripture says, the Lord has already left you. That's not a place you want to be, but it happens subtly. It happens slowly until one day it can feel like the bottom drops completely out. But the bottom didn't drop out that day. The bottom dropped out in pieces along the way as your heart became dedicated to a different passion, as your heart drifted from the Lord. It can be months or years, but the Lord has seen it through the whole time. So here's the big idea for this morning. How you take care of your heart will determine the tenure and tenor of your leadership. How you take care of your heart determines the leadership God entrusts you with, where that leadership goes, how that leadership turns out, the influence that you have, the we like to look at results, the we like to look at metrics, the we like to look at people in position. God is always looking at the heart. He looks at it when he picks us. He looks at it as he sustains us. He looks at it all the way through the process. And though we might be able to, at some point, God, look at what I've done for you. God says, who are you to me? You know, Jesus talked about in scripture, uh, as he's talking to his disciples, said, many will say to me on the day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? They'll say, look at my resume, Lord. I did all this for you. And Jesus will say, I don't even know you. Depart from me. That's a message none of us wants to hear. That's something none of us wants to get to. The only thing sadder than not attaining our goals in life is to attain those goals and to realize they didn't really matter. To come up short. So this morning, how we take care of our hearts will determine the tenure of our leadership. So to take care of our hearts, I think there's a couple of things that we should never forget. And we see them in the negative in the life of King Saul, the first king of Israel. So first thing we should never forget, number one, is never forget where you came from. Never forget where you came from, who you were when the Lord found you. First scripture we're going to look at is in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. And I read it in a couple different versions, and I think the New Living Translation kind of is the clearest for us what's happening in this moment. Uh, it says in verse 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 9, this is Samuel um, uh, talking to King Saul. King Saul had, uh, he wasn't king at this point, but he was looking for his father's lost donkeys, and he's out on this search. He comes across the prophet. The prophet Samuel says this. The Lord had already spoken to him. Samuel says, don't worry about those donkeys. They were lost, that were lost three days ago, for they have been found. Now, he's like, that was your mission, but here's the more important thing. And I'm here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Depending on the version you're reading, it says, a couple of different things, but the bottom line was, and Saul understood this, you're going to be the next king. That's what those words mean. You are the focus of all Israel's hopes. They're, they're hoping for a king, and you and your family are it. So we see where Saul's heart is at in verse 21 when Saul replies, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel. In my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? We get a picture right here. We get a little glimpse of young Saul's heart. And at this moment, it's humble. He's much like, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the difference between Samson and Gideon in the judges of Israel. Samson was pretty self-assured, and Gideon was pretty self-conscious and, uh, and insecure. But the Lord did a lot through Gideon's life. This is where Saul starts. I'm the least 
of the least, why are you telling me that I get to be king? Here's a point for us to remember that in any kind of leadership, soul work is the most important work. Working on your soul is as important as anything you'll ever accomplish. See, you may not get promoted for working on your soul, but you can certainly get fired for neglecting it. You may not get advanced because of how close your relationship with Jesus is, but if it drifts far enough and if things happen in your life, that can cause it to end. I've heard it said before that that competency gets you in the room, but it's character that will keep you there. And nobody else can do it for you. Nobody else can, can train you enough or can do it in your place. You can't outsource your soul to somebody else. You're the only one that can take care of it, no matter what role you're in. Nobody will even ask you about it in many cases until it's too late. Until, how's your soul, is the question you might ask at the moment when somebody's life is in the process of burning down. See, everybody is going to care about the condition of your soul after you crash and burn. But it's up to you and the people close to you to guard your heart, to work on your relationship with Jesus, to stay close to him, to work on your integrity now, ahead of time. The way we do that is through our private disciplines, by keeping a close relationship with Jesus, no matter how busy or hectic or demanding life gets, we don't forget the fundamentals. What are they? Time in the Word of God. Spending time with Him. Sometimes it's a joy and sometimes it's a push to get through it, but that's how we feed our souls and feed our relationship with God. It's not just about more information. You might have read the Bible 7, 8, 17, 18, 78, 79 times through. You've got the information. But reading God's word isn't about just getting information and checking off facts. It's about a conversation with the Lord. And and let me see a show of hands. Somebody who's been reading the Bible for decades and you still find new inspiration from stuff you've read many times. Anybody else in here? Happens to me almost on a weekly basis. I go, I knew that story. I've preached on that story. I've taught on that text. But wow, Holy Spirit, you just spoke something different to me. Now, that's not every time you read the Bible. Sometimes you're going, well, Lord, I don't know what this passage in Leviticus meant to me today or what this list of names is supposed to speak to my heart. But Jesus, I love you. And so I keep coming back. Time in the Word. Time in prayer. Spending time to talk to God. And sometimes those prayers are thank yous, and sometimes those prayers are help me's, and sometimes those prayers can just be, God, here's how I'm doing today. But I heard another teacher say it this way, that our private disciplines should grow with our public successes. So, as the Lord gives you success in life, be that at work, as you climb the corporate ladder, your private disciplines become more important. In fact, your time in them, your dedication to them should grow. It's not a place of going, okay, now I've attained this level in the companies, I God's done good things, great. I'm glad I don't have to work at it anymore. No, it's a relationship that we have with the Lord. In relationships, they're either going forward or they're going backward. Amen. But they're not often staying at a, at, a, at a neutral level. So private discipline should grow with public success. And it's small steps of obedience that keep taking us in the right direction. You may be going, Pastor, I'm stalled out in my Bible reading. I, I don't know, I'm reading the Bible, but I don't know. Uh, what the Lord is speaking to me. You might say prayer feels like, like they bounce off the ceiling sometimes. You might say, I come to worship and it used to really touch my heart. I used to cry, but I don't cry. I might say this. Is there any area in your life where you feel like God's asking you to be obedient, that you're either just resisting or you don't want to do, it's going to be too tough, or you've quit asking him? Because sometimes it's our steps of obedience that lead us closer to Jesus. Not, not another uh, dictionary of knowledge, not another chapter of knowledge that we need, but, but we got to do the stuff we read about. we got to believe the stuff we read about enough to do it, enough to step out on a limb and, and follow through on it before we read any further. I was reading a while ago in a book called Love Does by author, uh, author Bob Goff, and he said uh, he'd been a, a saint for many years and loved Jesus for many years. He had a Bible study with friends where I think they, they changed the name from a Bible study to a Bible doing. When they came across a passage They would park there. They wouldn't go any further in their Bible study until they had done that thing. Even if it was weeks or months, they'd come back, nope, we still haven't done that thing. If that was caring for the poor, if that was telling somebody else about Jesus, they wouldn't let themselves read it and just move on, but they would go and do it. 
Small steps of obedience take us closer to where God needs to go. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget how Jesus found you, the condition you were in. For some of us, uh, we call that our testimony. How Jesus found us. And we, maybe we got tired of telling our testimony. Maybe we think everybody's heard it or, or we're sick of going over those details. But let me tell you, Jesus isn't sick of hearing about the redemption he's brought in your life. So for some of us, it's a hard story to tell because of where we were. We may have been adults. We may have been involved in things that we're not proud of. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget what Jesus saved you from. Some of us got saved or, or came to know Jesus when we were so little that, that we think it's just not much of a story to tell. You know, I was in, uh, in preschool, and I, I raised my hand at the end of the lesson, and, and that's been it, and I've been following Jesus ever since. That's not so exciting. Don't forget where you came from. That same childlike faith Jesus prizes. I think that sometimes he wishes we would just get back to that, where we just believed and we didn't make it more complicated. We didn't say, but what about, but what, but what if, and we said yes. I don't you just love how kids are so eager if you've taught in kids' ministry? Like you put the gospel out there and they go, yeah, I want that. I want to do that. All the bad things I've done, he says they're over with and I can go to heaven. Yep. See, we don't need to grow up from that. We need to carry that with us, not forget where we came from. Second thing we shouldn't forget is we shouldn't forget how we got here, how we got to where we are today. If you got your Bible, you can turn over uh, probably just one page to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now this is part of the, uh, the coronation or, or the, the selecting of Saul as king. We read in chapter 10 and verse 6, it says this, Samuel speaking to Saul says, The Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. Verse 9, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. Never forget how you got to where you are right now. How you got to the place God has put you in. For Saul, it was that God changed his heart. God came powerfully upon him. God saw a person of humility, and God gave him the ability to do what he was asking him to do. In verse 6, Samuel tells Saul, you will be changed into a different person. Isn't that the gospel? That he changes us into a different person. Amen. In verse 9, it says that as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. Some of us, we can remember the day that God changed our heart. Maybe some of us, today is the day that God wants to change your heart. But may we never forget how we got from where we were to where we are. See, here's another idea. Leadership is just a temporary assignment. Whatever kind of influence, leadership you have right now, it's just temporary influence in anyone's life is just a momentary trust that God has placed in your life. And you may not feel like you have a lot, or you may not feel like it matters a lot, but it matters a lot to God who has placed it with you, has entrusted whoever he's entrusted around you, but it's for a short time. In the kingdom of God, power is not ever something to be grasped after, but leadership is something to be stewarded, to be taken care of, to be taken seriously. What counts for eternity is not the number of people you oversee, but the number of people you serve. The number of people you oversee may always be small, but the number of people you serve can grow and can keep growing. And that is the heart of our Father, is to continue to serve and to take the role of a servant, to climb down the ladder, as it were. The same way Jesus did when he got down on his knees and washed his disciples' feet, he showed them what leadership in the kingdom of God really looks like. It's not about position, title, authority, recognition. It's about service. It's about finding a way to serve people. That's why we call what we do on a Sunday morning a, a service. Like we are, we are serving one another as we are serving God. That's what leadership is really about. Uh, let's not forget, though, what it, take to get, what it took to get us where we are today. 
many of us would look at where we are in life and we would say this, only by the grace of God am I where I'm at today. Only by the grace of God can I stand here with all you people and worship. Only by the grace of God am I breathing today. Only by the grace of God am I not in jail today. Only by the grace of God am I not in the cemetery today. Only by the grace of God. Don't forget that. Amen. Don't forget how he brought you to where he's brought you today. I, I saw a real good quote of inspiration years ago in a commercial of all things. The commercial said this, you want to get, you want to get rich quick? And a lot of us say, yeah, I want to get rich quick. They said, if you want to get rich quick, start counting your blessings. Start counting all the ways that God has blessed you along the way. Don't count what you don't have. Count what you do have. Start counting your many blessings. How's the song go? Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Because sometimes we just count the losses, but God is always counting the wins. Count your blessings. You get rich quick. Don't forget how God has brought you here. But evidently, Saul forgot how God had brought him where he brought him. Because really quickly, Saul took that advice, that, that command actually from Samuel that said, wait for me. I will offer the sacrifices. You know the story, Saul did not wait. Saul offered sacrifices. And then again, Saul went ahead uh, another time. And, and, and when he was told to wipe out the enemy, Saul saved back the best parts. He he spared some people's lives as political prisoners. He, he kept some of the animals aside, the, the best to offer a sacrifice to God, thinking he was doing a great thing. But it was not a great thing because it was not obedient to what the Lord had told him. So our third and final point this morning is never forget who you work for. Never forget who your work is for. Never forget who's the boss. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 17. Samuel summarizes why Saul has now been rejected as king and becomes the king that we kind of recognize him as somebody not to be emulated. And God ultimately needed to replace in verse 17 of 1 Samuel chapter 15. It says, Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes and did not become the head of the tribe, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. It's a principle we don't have time to dive into now, but when God said destroy it all, he meant all. Verse 19, why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Verse 20, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. You, you see the, the flaw there in his reasoning? I did what the Lord said. I completely destroyed them and brought back their king. That's not completely destroying them. It says in verse 21, The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord God at Gilgal. Verse 22, But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? God doesn't need sheep. God doesn't need goats. God doesn't need your cash. God doesn't need your position. He's after our obedience. It says to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Those are harsh words. But it was a harsh thing that Saul had done to step in and take the place of the prophet, to offer the sacrifice, to, to jump ahead of where God was going. Saul's desire for greatness in the eyes of his people was greater than his desire to please God. I think for a moment there, Saul wanted to be at the center of all of it. I want to be the one offering the sacrifice, the religious leader and the political leader. Uh, I want to do it all. And I don't know if he just felt uh, a little bit lost because he was the first king of Israel. He didn't have his daddy to tell him what to do. There, there was no handing down of this responsibility. Israel had never had a king. They'd just seen these other kings around them. And what those other kings do, those other kings make it about them, and, and they offer the sacrifice, and everybody looks to them as the great restorer. And so maybe Saul feels like he's trying to man up 
and be the man and step up and be what his people are asking him to be. And Samuel says, that's never what God asked you to be. He asked you to be obedient. So here's a lesson for us. I think we should work twice as hard on our character as we do on our competency. See, people around you ask you to work on your competency, get better at what you do, go to a seminar, train, get fit, get smart. But who's asking you to work hard on your character, on who you are, on your integrity? Everyone will ask you to increase your competency, and everyone will just assume that you're working on your character on your own time and in your own way. They might not even ask you about it. But if you blow it, everyone will attack you for your lack of character. Everyone will hold you responsible for the deficits in your character, and nobody can work on it but you. The real tragedy is you may not even recognize the deficit that you have in character until it's too late. You have to be proactive in responding to it because if you're reactive, you just can't ever be retroactive. You can't go back and fix it once it's broke. How you take care of your heart will determine the tenure, the length, the quality of your leadership. You know, the people of Israel had a lot of kings. Saul was the first, but it went on for centuries. Some were good, some were bad, some were really pretty great, some were incredibly wicked. In fact, many of them. And by the end, they go into uh, exile and, uh, and deportation. You see that this whole idea of a king was really kind of a bad idea from the beginning. Maybe God knew what he was talking about when he said, I am your king, you don't need a king. It went a lot better when God picked his leaders as they went. You know, this is a big week for us in America. This is a big week about picking people <laughs> with your pencil, marking in a little bubble, picking people. Let us remember this, though, as we're picking people. Let's not devolve into picking on other people because of the picks they make, because we're all just doing the best that we can with the options that we can. And like the people of Israel, we may not have awesome options in front of us, but we have an awesome God that we serve. And as you read through the book of Samuel and 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles, you see that God was at work even when the king was bad. God wanted good leadership for his people, but God didn't pin all his hopes on the one person in charge. God didn't pin all his hopes on the name on the door, but the name above all names is what carried the day. So let's not get involved in picking on people this week because the way we treat others says a lot about the condition of our heart, where we're at with Jesus and our soul. So you and I probably won't do any good changing people's minds on Facebook about which candidate they're going to pick. I don't know if you'd raise your hand and say, Facebook convinced me to change my vote. I don't think that's going to happen. Nobody's changing who they're voting for based on what they see on Facebook, but people may change their opinion of you based on what you say on Facebook. That's still up for grabs. How we treat people, how we talk to people, how we shout out to the void that is the internet matters. Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So as we talk and as we vote and as we uh, look at the results of this vote this week, let us remember that the people of God are to be a people of peace, people of peacemakers, people of hope, hope beyond this world, hope for life in the next. So this week, even as tensions are rising around us in our culture, let me encourage you just to watch your words especially with people outside the family of faith. As you go to work, just watch your words. Don't torch a long-term relationship over what is a short-term situation. Who is in the White House is a short-term situation. Uh, short-term maybe four, eight years, longer, but that's a short-term situation. The relationships you have may last a lot longer. And so just keep that in mind, whatever happens this week and whatever the Lord is leading you to do in your vote. But it all ever comes back to how we treat Jesus, how we share Jesus, what we do for Jesus. So I'm going to close this morning with a story. And as I do, I'm going to ask Joy to come and play the keys behind me. I found this story years ago, and it goes like this. It's about a portrait. Years ago, there was a very wealthy man who, with his devoted young son, shared a passion for collecting art. Together, they traveled around the world adding only the finest treasures of art to their collection. Priceless works by Picasso, Van Gogh, Monet, and many others adorned the walls of their family home. As winter approached, war engulfed that nation, 
and the young man left to serve his country. But after only a few short weeks, his father received a telegram. His beloved son had died while rushing a fellow soldier to a medic. Distress and loneliness filled the old man's heart. One day, there was a knock at the door. As he opened the door, he was greeted by a soldier with a package under his arm. He introduced himself to the old man by saying, I was a friend of your son. I was the one he was rescuing when he died. But I'm also an artist, and I want to give you this. As the old man unwrapped the package, the paper gave way to reveal a portrait of the man's son. Though the world would never consider it the work of a genius, the painting featured the young man's face in striking detail. Overcome with emotion, the man thanked the soldier, promising to hang the picture over his fireplace. The painting of his son soon became his most prized possession, far eclipsing the million-dollar works of art that he owned. He told his neighbors it was the greatest gift he had ever received. The following spring, the old man became ill and passed away. When it was announced that the man's collection would be auctioned, art collectors from around the world gathered to bid on some of the world's most spectacular paintings. The auction began with a painting that was not on anyone's museum list. It was the painting of the man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid, but the room was silent. Who will open the bidding with $100, he asked. Minutes passed, and no one even spoke. From the back of the room, someone said, who cares about that painting? It's just a picture of his son. Let's forget it and get on to the good stuff. More voices echoed in agreement. No, we have to sell this one first, replied the auctioneer. Now, who will take the son? Finally, a friend of the old man spoke up. Will you take $10 for the painting? That's all I have. I knew the boy, so I'd like to have it. I have $10, will anyone go higher? Said the auctioneer. After more silence, the auctioneer said, going once, going twice, sold. The gavel fell and cheers filled the room and someone exclaimed, now we can get on with it and we can bid on these treasures. The auctioneer looked at the audience and announced that the auction was over. Stunned, disbelief filled the quiet room. Someone spoke up and said, what do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for a picture of some old man's dead son. What about all of these paintings? There are millions of dollars of art here. I demand that you explain what's going on. The auctioneer replied, very simple. According to the will of the father, whoever takes the son gets it all. <laughs> Friends, whoever takes the son gets it all. If you have taken Jesus into your life, you get it all. The treasures of this world don't mean a thing. In fact, Jesus says they come along when you take his son, Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary. You know the difference between Saul and King David who would follow him? I believe it was the pace of their repentance. David messed up in some pretty spectacular ways, but he repented fast and he repented hard. Saul also fell, but Saul's repentance was slow and really incomplete. So let me ask you today, what's your pace of repentance? When the Holy Spirit tells you this needs to be fixed, how quickly do you jump into action? When people tell you this is not a good area of your life, how quickly do you respond to fix it? What's your pace of repentance? See, this morning you may be in the middle of a moral slide and not even realize it. Your heart may already be succumbing to the gravity of self and collapsing. You may already be feeling the weight of compromise. But the good news is, it's never too late. It is never too late. As long as you're breathing, there's room for redemption. The bad news is, the longer you wait, the more painful the consequences. So let me ask you today, are you ready and willing to take the sun to get it all? Are you ready to leave behind the things of this world that do grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Would you bow your heads with me today? I wanna to say, first of all, if you're here with us or if you're watching with us online, and Jesus Christ is not the Lord and Savior of your life yet, 
I want to give you that opportunity that that auctioneer gave to say, will you take the son? Will you forsake all the other things of this world and chase after Jesus? It starts really simply. Just by confessing your need for him, your sin, accepting that he's the only one that can rescue you and confessing your love and your life for him. So if you're here today and you want to start a relationship with Jesus, you want to take him into your life, I'm just going to ask you to do something real simple, but real profound. I'm going to ask you to raise a hand. We're going to pray together. If you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, you don't already have one, but you want to walk out of this room saying, I want the son. I'm watching at home and I'm saying, I want Jesus Christ in my life. That's you. You can raise your hand even if you're watching on a computer at home. We're going to pray together in just a second. Secondly, I want to talk to all of us. You'd say, I do follow Jesus with my life, but I want to take the son and forsake all the things of this world because compromise is creeping at my door and I'm not going to make it without Jesus. Maybe I realized this morning that I have been forgetting where I came from. I'm forgetting where I started. I'm forgetting who's in charge and I need to remember today. Jesus, I want to recommit to you my heart. I want you to take hold of my heart. If that's you today, I just ask you to do a bold thing. We're going to pray together. You just slip up a hand and say, Jesus, here I am. Here's where you can find me, right here. I want to recommit my heart to you, Lord. I know that it's what you care about the most. It's the thing you're after, and I'm going to give it to you willingly. It's been sought after by other people, by other places, by other things, but I'm saving it for you, Jesus. Help me to be strong. Let's pray. If you raise your hand here or watching online, would you just repeat these words after me? Dear Jesus, forgive me for what I've done. I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you are the Savior. And I commit to live my life for you. Father, I pray for all those who prayed that prayer. Would you rush in with your encouragement today? Would you rush in with your uh, resounding joy of committing their life to you? Tell us the angels in heaven rejoice when even one makes that move. And so, Jesus, would you help us to feel that joy as people make that move too? Now, Father, I pray for all of us in this room, no matter where we stand with you, I pray, Jesus, you would have our hearts. Lord, we want to commit to you right now that the world doesn't get our heart, the world doesn't get our passion, the world doesn't get our soul. That is saved for you, Jesus. And so whatever it costs us, whatever we give up, whatever we lay aside, it's worth it because you tell us in your word, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul. So Jesus, I pray today for all of our souls, the conditions of our hearts, Lord. I pray as we leave this place that we wouldn't be able to shake the the, the conviction on our hearts that your Holy Spirit lays there to say, fix this, address this, work on this, let me work on this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would work on our hearts even as we go back to work this week, even as we go back home into our home relationships this week, would you work on our hearts, even as we vote and hear the results of voting this week, may you continue to work on our hearts. Let our hearts be right with you before our mouths speak to other people. Jesus, for all this, we give you thanks and we humbly submit that you are the boss. You are the king of the universe, the king eternal, immortal, and invisible, the only true God. So to you, we give praise both now and forevermore. In that name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? Pray that you go in the grace and the peace of Jesus this week. I pray that no matter what the world looks like when we gather together again, that we know that we have hope in Jesus. No matter what's going on in the world around us, that that we have a hope that outlasts this life. And so uh, in that vein... We're actually, this church is a polling place. People are going to come in here and make their decisions in this room. So uh, in kind of a housekeeping announcement, everybody whose chairs are on this side of the room, uh, we're going to need you to stack those for us. We're going to help the poll workers. So if you're a row, if you just stack your row up in a stack, if you're on this side of the line of center court, uh, that would help us a lot. So may you go with Jesus this week. Be a blessing in your community. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you Wednesday, Sunday, or anywhere else down the road. Have a good one.